Amen. Well, hey guys, I thought uh, before I dive into the to the word and sharing today, that uh, just have a quick opportunity to have a few guys come up and 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 share a testimony. And so there's a couple a couple different guys we've been praying for uh, over the last couple of weeks and and months. And so you know, it's good to get reports back on you know what the prayers are are doing and how prayer is effective. And so uh, Tim, if you wouldn't mind coming up and just sharing. Maybe like a Sharon, Sharon for a minute, just you know, since we prayed for you last when you were here. Yeah, that's kind of what happened, and uh, I, I, I don't even know how to describe what happened. Like, what would what had been crippling me in the struggle that it happened? Like, I would I would hear voices, and they were troubling me, and I thought I had control of them, but then they got to me really bad, and I was sitting right here, and like this. The word got me, and like I asked to be for them to be driven out, and they were driven out, and they still try to come at me, but they're on the outside of my head now. They're not inside, like right. disrupting me. Even right now, sitting in there, sitting in the chair, like they're like, dude, come on, just I was like, and I'm, I'm like pushing them out, and because they're, they're trying to get back in, and it, it's just, I, I'm, I have no words to describe like the immenseness of it, because I, I, I'm, I'm traversed in the in the scriptures, I understand them and I believe in them. My problem is, is that they came back in because I started growing cold because I was trying to control my family, trying to control my walk, trying to just trying to control. And like, I, I have to have no control because right. God is in control. Amen. Yes. And if I try to take control, then I'll end up right back where I came from. And it's, it's not going to happen. I, I can't, I can't afford to die again. So it's like now I'm, I'm amongst the living because I was once dead for a long time. And I can't have it. And I moved by the Spirit, just read those. Because it's like, I'm, I'm a dead man if I go back out. Mm, that's right. And like I'd rather be a live man here amongst brothers th- in the truth and stay alive than go back out on the outside and die again. Because yeah. how many times can we really die and come back? I physically died when I was 17 years old, and I didn't bring myself back. I was drunk. I hit a brick wall doing 50 miles an hour in a 71 Chevy pickup truck. Scar on my forehead to prove it. Bit a dashboard. Lights out. Right. But mm. I'm here to talk about it. God brought me back for a reason. I don't know the full purpose, but I know it's here to bring the word to people that wouldn't hear it otherwise. Yeah. 228 tattoos because I put them on myself because I thought it was the thing to do. That will help get the word to people that were like, oh, I'm not going to listen to a $3,000 suit. Some dude preaching on the TV. I'll listen to this clown because he's funny and weird, but hey, he's got Jesus, so let's have what he's got. (laughs) So that's that's where it's at. This man is anointed, and like that's why I'm back here. Because I was fighting God, like, why do I got to go back to Bulldog? It's like I feel at home there, but like, why can't I find home anywhere else? It's like, because your home is nowhere else, but but here. If your home wasn't here, then you would be somewhere else. So you're here, so I can bring my family back. Yes, together. Yes, yeah. And on that note, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Richard, have a quick update on your foot. I'm and then, oh, that rich. Oh, that rich. And then we'll, we'll then we got coming to you next. Let me tell you about my Jesus. I always had problems with my feet, but this latest, like two weeks ago, it was just I couldn't even walk. It was like a big potato. It was hurting. Uh, anything, any move, even a sheet on the bed would hurt it. It was so sensitive. I really felt bad for my dog because my dog, every day we walk, for like 10 days we couldn't walk with him. And he would get, he would see me and he'll get ready. To walk. I'm sorry, dog, can't take you for a walk. So praying and praying, but last week when Ryan prayed and healed me and uh, anointed me with oil, soon when I got home, me and the dog walked. Wow. Amen. It was a big turnaround. Even though I got sensitivity, I'm still claiming I'm healed. You know, that divine help because yeah. this is nothing compared to what Jesus was. Oh, come on. Right, yeah. You know, how he was on the cross. And yeah. So this is very minimal. So I take it as a complete blessing. And you guys are just sharpening. We're, we're sharpening each other. Right. Amen. Right. And we're just Amen. keeping that faith, keeping oh, that right. stronghold, keeping that go forward and not yeah. looking back. Amen. I can even do cartwheels like the Blues Brothers. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I won't do it right now. Let's see it. Special name is Shay. Said. 
I mean, <coughs> that's it. Yeah. That's it. Praise Jesus. That's right. I mean, praise Jesus. Hallelujah. You got to have so much faith. Okay, I'll give you a quick testimony, right? That's what you want. I wasn't even prepared to be up here today. <laughs> and I'm a guy that can't Come shut on, up, and I have not, I'm have i so speechless right now. It's crazy. It's really crazy. I was sitting there going, please don't call me. <laughs> um, so about eight weeks ago, um, my back started really, really, really bad. Sending pain down my leg really, really bad. And went to the doctor. They didn't know if it was my hips. Then I found out through this process that I do have avascular necrosis in both my hips, which means my hips are dying, but they're still okay. But that wasn't the problem. Uh, then they went back to the back. They gave me a shot in my back to see if that would help. It didn't help at all. And then it progressively got worse and worse and worse. I don't want to bore you with the story, but it got to the point where I couldn't sit on a toilet. And, I, and that's not a joke. I couldn't, I couldn't get myself to pee Okay, not to be graphic, because I was in so much pain, I would literally just be sitting there like, come on, you know, and uh, excruciating pain. And I can take a lot of pain. I've taken a lot of pain in my life. I have a really high pain tolerance. I've gone through some procedures where I don't even get anesthesia. I, I'll do it without it. Like, But this was incredible pain, incredible pain. Um, and I'm such a nut. I kept going to work. I said, I'm going to get through Christmas, which I did, and I sucked it up, and I'm sitting there in the kitchen, like, just bent over, and I'm helping, trying to do the biscuit and everything. That. And then I'm a knucklehead because the next day there's this job that's right below the Hollywood sign, and I want that job. But I figure, and my, my doctor's like, you got to get to the emergency room. And this was before Christmas. Like, you got to go there. They were out of town. They said, you got to go to the emergency room. You got to get in there. Go to UCLA, USC, or Cedars. Okay? So I go to this job site. And I'm in pain, I'm ta and I talk to other people, I got the job, thank you. <laughs> and then afterwards, I'm like, well, what's closer? Cedars. Cedars, what a blessing. I go in there, I spend like four hours in the emergency room, and I'm just waiting to get sent up. Long story short, okay, here I am, a guy eight weeks ago, dragging 200, 250 pounds, being able to put this stuff in the back of a truck, and all this stuff, all by myself. You know, I'm pretty strong for my age, I'm 54. And, uh, and then uh, here I am, I can't even sit on a toilet, right? And, I'm, and, I, and, and I'm gonna get to the real good part in a minute. This is the good part, okay? You like to talk, right? I'm gonna get to the good part in a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These teams are not gonna... We just need a visual, that's all I know. Hey, Jerry, my brother Jerry taught him. So, so anyways, I, I wanna get, just come with me, so I'm in, I'm in the hospital room. They come in. They say, wipe yourself down with these wipes because you're going to go into surgery in an hour, okay? And they came in to do a surgery on a Sunday because I was so writhing in pain, you know? Um, and as I'm in there, my jaw starts chattering. I'm like, and I'm in so much pain. This is ridiculous. I'm like, I thought I was in as much pain as a man could be in, and then it was worse. And then I go into surgery, right? And I get, I get out, and here I am. I'm fine. I'm okay. You know oh, what wow. I mean? Now... Let me get to the good part. Here's the good part. I always preach to, to guys, and I said, look, you're not going to find satisfaction in anything in your life. You can go to the drink, and you, you can drink, and then you need another one, right? Stay satisfied. You can go to the sex, but you got to do it again and watch it again. You can try to get satisfaction out of your friends, but you got to keep on hanging out with them, right? Even if they're bad, it doesn't matter. But if you have God, it's satisfaction all the time. You have faith in God, you're okay. So I always use the preach, whether you're sick or you're healthy, you're okay. So people always say, Greg, how you doing? I'm great. You know what I mean? Why? Or why are you so great? Well, I'm great because I got God in my life, period. You got money, no money, you're great. Through this whole thing, really tested the faith of a man because you really don't know what is your faith. I talk about it. And I still say, as much as people look at me in life, they go, well, Greg, you're a man of God. I said, you know what? You don't know how much I'm not a man of God <laughs> and how much more I need to be a man of God, even now. Because they would tell this to me 10 years ago and five years ago. And now I'm closer to God than I've ever been. And still, I'm not there. But through this whole process, I was like, God, thank you for all of this. Thank you for all of this that's happening because I know it's going to be used for your glory. Right. I know that. And I know I need to get through this so I can... Maybe even just today affect somebody that that by the glory of God he he has great surgeons and I was blessed to have 
insurance, and I was blessed to have people praying for me. I just want to thank all you guys for praying for me. I really do, because those prayers, that's what got me through. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's what got me through, because I knew I was going to be okay no matter what, and I'm okay. Right. So thank you. Amen. Thank you, guys. Amen. All right. Well, it's you know powerful to hear those testimonies and hear people share where they've been, what, what God has done, and, and it breathes, it breathes life and, and encouragement and hope. For those that are still, you know, on this side of their miracle, and so that's why we're in here. Richard's testimony next Tuesday because he's got his appointment on Friday, and so he'll be rolling in with the testimony uh, for us next week. But it it gives that that hope and it gives that inspiration that people need. That you know, people kind of lose hope that that God is still doing miracles and He's still a miracle worker. And that God is still touching lives. And so it's powerful to be able to share those things and encourage one another. And that's the idea. Scripture talks about when I, you know, when we get together, I want to be encouraged by your faith. And I want to encourage you with mine. It's a mutual encouragement of faith. And that's what testimonies do. So continue to share those outside of this group as well. You know, any chance you get, be sharing those testimonies of, of God's healing, God's provision, God's power. Because those are things that that are going to liven people up and are going to awaken, awaken the, the sleepers that are out there and need something. They need a testimony. They need somebody that's had a personal touch with God to actually approach them and share with them and encourage them. All right. Well, let's get to this word here this morning and dive right in. Uh, we're going to do maybe a couple weeks on really reading and, and diving into to the word and understanding our own personal time and, and personal reading of the Bible and Scripture. And that's one of the things that I'm super passionate about and, and I'm really excited about because it's, it's one of the things that has transformed my life the most is about seven years ago committing to reading the Bible every single morning and not just for like 15 or 20 minutes, but about an hour to an hour and a half every morning, you know, waking up before the, the kids would wake up, you know, getting up at five and, and getting a coffee and getting the word open and having tons of time to just dig in with the Lord and, and see what happened. And that's what totally you know, renewed my mind. Talking about a renewing of your mind process is just being able to, to dive into the Word. And it's not about trying to get through a certain number of pages or stick to a yearly, you know, reading plan. Whether it was, you know, one one paragraph, one page, ten pages, it didn't matter. And that's why I love what Dan Muller always says of, you know, you're not reading the Word to get through it, you're reading it to become it. And so that's a powerful you know, way to approach your, your Bible reading is that I'm not just trying to get through it for the day. I'm trying to become it for the day. I want to become more and more like Christ from one degree of glory to another, as it says. So that's just part of diving into the word. And not only that, but we're here as, you know, uh, part of discipleship. Part of that is being discipled. And then part of that in turn is then discipling other people. So some of this may not necessarily just be for you, but it could also be for sharing this with other people that are struggling to get into the Word, struggling to make sense of the Word. And, and a lot of what we're going to kind of go through today even came to me from working with college students that have kind of ex- accepted the worldly ways. And when they read Scripture, they're reading it from our current cultural context. And then they're all offended and they're put off and they're you know wrestling with how could God be good and all these sorts of things because they're missing the, the entire scope of it. And that's why I put at the very top of this a quote from Todd White, who said that people often use modern culture as their filter for interpreting Scripture rather than using an image of a holy, righteous, all-powerful, exquisite God as their filter for interpreting Scripture. So first and foremost, when we're coming to the Word of God, we're reminding ourselves when we pick that thing up, like this is the very Word of God that comes from a holy, righteous, all-powerful, exquisite God that this is one extremely long love letter that God gave us to read. And that's what's so crazy is like when we don't actually pick this up and read it for ourselves, when you think about it and and say, you know, how many people believe that this is the word of God? And, you know, most people in a church will, will raise their hand. And then when you say, how many people are reading this every day or even every week? All of a sudden, very few hands are going up. But it's like, it's just completely illogical. Like just, just using pure logic. You could see, you can't say that I believe that this is the word of God and then let it collect dust and never actually read it for yourself. Like that would be insane 
to think that God gave you a uh, gave you a personalized written letter and then you're just like, nah, are you going to open that? Nah, I'm good. Yeah. It's just like you wouldn't do it. And so we've got to really dive in. And in particular, what we're going to work through is, is when people are reading kind of hard scripture. And again, this kind of goes back to our current cultural context is a lot of people, you know, can get offended by so much different scripture throughout the word. And so there's some hard stuff to, to read and to grapple with. And, but we've got to be able to do so and do so wisely and be able to do that. So, I mean, even, and I gave some examples here from Matthew chapter 10, 37 through 39. It says, if you love your, Jesus said, if you love your father or mother more than you love me, you're not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. And I mean, people can wrestle and have such a hard time with that, of feeling like, how could, how could Jesus ever possibly demand that? How could he, you know, and they can come up with all sorts of different reasons to, to hate on that scripture because they want to cling to their life. They want their way and they want it God's way as well at the same time. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, Again, it says, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And you can even see in our, cult, in our cultural context, everybody knows in this, under this tent which one everybody's going to have the biggest problem with because of the cultural context. Yet we all will go through that scripture and it says, you know, those who will not inherit the kingdom of God, those who indulge in sexual sin. Well, I mean, how much sexual sin are we talking, really? You know, those who worship idols. Well, I don't really worship an idol. Like, I don't go out to, you know, a shear a pole or whatever they talked about in the Old Testament. And it's like, but you're going and you're worshiping all these other things. Maybe it's a sports team. Maybe it's a, you know, maybe it's a woman. Who knows what it is that we feel in, but we justify and rationalize ourselves out of these things. Committing adultery. Jesus said, you've heard it been said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But if you even just lusted after someone with your eyes, you've already committed adultery in your heart. And here he is saying that they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Male prostitutes, homosexuality, and thieves. How much thievery are we talking? How much thievery can we get away with? That's, no, that's right. In the state of California. You know, so we go through these different things. You know, greedy people. Well, how, I mean, what's greedy? Drunkards. I mean, what considered, you know, what, what level do you have to get to to be a drunkard? Uh, being abusive or cheating. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. We've got to be able to wrestle with some of these things. They're so hard. In James 3, 14 through 16, but if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying for jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. I mean, even when, you know, people will, but yet so many, uh, so many believers still have jealousy and selfish ambition in their heart. And they're masking it and covering it up. Yet it's being laid down in scripture super hard and saying that that is straight up demonic. Like what you have in your heart is demonic. And then we get in, in 1 John 3, 4 through 10. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law, for all sin is contrary to the law of God. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins, and there is no sin in him. Anyone who continues to live in him will not sin, but anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they are they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning but the son of God came to destroy the works of the devil those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them so they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God 
So now we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to God. So again, these are hard scriptures. To say that someone might be the devil, the son of the devil, rather than cheerfully proclaiming everybody to be children of God. Like there's some hard stuff to, to really grapple with here for people, and they can get all sorts of twisted uh, up and up and down and all around about it and, and miss the bigger points. And so that's where I want to work through five things that have kind of helped me to be able to understand Scripture in its, its full context. And number one is that God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. You guys got it. You've heard it. I grew up Catholic, so I didn't know that that was a thing. And so the first time somebody came up to me and did that, and they were like, God is good all the time. I was just like, you know it. Uh, then somebody in the background was like, oh, all the time, God is good. I was like, oh, that's a thing, apparently, all right. But it's this idea that, that if we take that into our Bible reading, if we take that into our reading of Scripture, if that's true, then what eternal good is there in these seemingly hard, challenging Scripture that ultimately makes it worthwhile and worthy of obedience, even if it means persecution, suffering, or even pain in the short term, or giving up your own way, is that knowing that God is good. So if God is good, and I believe that, then I have to read some of these hard Scriptures, and believe me, there's plenty of others. And, and really, depending upon what cultural context you find yourself in, you're going to find certain scriptures hard and, and others you won't even bat an eye at. And then people in other cultures won't even bat an eye at it, the, the scripture we think is hard, but then they'll, they'll have problems with something else. So it's all cultural and relative in terms of which scriptures people find difficult and challenging and hard to believe. But we've got to have at the basis, God is good. So if that is true, then there's depth here. And we read in 1 Corinthians 6.11, which follows the scripture that we just read about all those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. And we read, we read that whole list. Well, following right after that in 1 Corinthians 6.11 says, some of you were once like that, which is that's what we hear with the testimonies in here. And that's the beauty of a life transformed for God is to be able to say, I was once like that. But then it goes on to say, but you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So God is good. Why? Because he brings reconciliation. He brings a cleansing. He brings holiness. He makes us righteous uh, before him. And even in Mark 10, 17 through 19, that's where the rich man approaches Jesus and he says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus responds, why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. So this is another foundational thing that we have to understand. Only God is truly good. And this goes back to what I bring up all the time of Satan's dangerous trap from Matthew 16, 23, where Jesus turns to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan, for you're a dangerous trap to me, for you're merely seeing things from a human point of view, not from God's. People cannot understand a good God and only God being good because they're merely seeing things and people from a human point of view. And even just this this last week, I was you know doing a counseling session with this woman that's just you know in part of our singles uh, group and having a really hard time. And because she was she found this kind of godly man, but then he was doing very deceitful and hurtful things. But she was so on the hook for this guy still is even though he's you know cut her off for now for months but yeah she's still on the hook with this guy emotionally with this attachment and you know she'll tell me all these things that he said and, and did but and then follow it up with but i mean he, he's a he's a good guy and i had to stop several times to say he is not a good guy like you've got to stop saying that he's deceived is what he is he's manipulative and you've got to, but yet she's seeing this merely from a human point. Because when you see it from God's point of view, you, God knows the actual heart condition of people. He knows their thoughts, their motives, their intentions. He knows all the ways that they've been deceived and are led astray and the things that they're doing. And how far they are from being truly good. But God himself is there. And we know in Romans eight twenty eight, 
And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes for them. So again, it's reaffirming God is good and God works all things together for good. He created all things with goodness built into them. And then in Genesis, we see from, from Joseph back to his brothers. His brothers have sold him into slavery and actually meant to kill him. And he, he ended up, you know, the, going into slavery was actually the, the better option because they meant to kill him and put an end to his life. And then he becomes the, the right hand to, to Pharaoh in Egypt and providing for his brothers. And in the end, he says in Genesis 50, 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done the saving of many lives. And then in Psalm 106, 1, Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And you could go on and on and on. I mean, Psalms is just littered with the goodness of God and how good he is. So that has to be one of the bases by which we, we read and we in, indulge in the word of God is knowing that this is good. It is fundamentally good. And then number two is this, from Isaiah 45, 19. It says, I, the Lord, speak only what is true and declare only what is right. So God is saying, it, 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 everything that is in here is true and right. And that that actually is a trustworthy saying. That even from our human point of view, if we fail to see how it could be true and right, we know that from God's point of view, in light of eternity, uh, it will be the, the light will be shed on it and the truth will come to fruition. So if that's true, then what eternal truth is there underlying the seemingly hard, challenging scripture? So if God speaks only what is true and declares only what is right, then I have to assume that what is in here is true and right and good. So when I come across things that are challenging to me, I got to be able to take a step back Take a step back from myself, from my desires, from my wishes, from the cultural context in which I'm living and what it prioritizes and what it deprioritizes. And I want to see it from God's point of view. I want to see it from a totally different perspective with a fresh set of eyes that actually brings out the truth and an eternal truth. Because we're not just talking about truth for a moment. We're talking about truth for all of eternity. It's not just going to be true for this generation, but for all generations. It's not going to be just true for this little blip on the radar. It's true for all of eternity, and that's powerful. So we're asking ourselves, what truth am I missing? What subjective short-term realities are clouding my judgment and inability to find the truth in Scripture? Because we know from 1 Corinthians 14, uh, 14 33 and many other places that it says that for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. So everything in here is written from a place of, of order, not from a place of chaos. It's written from a place of peace and unity, not from one of confusion. And yet so many people find themselves confused and befuddled because they haven't received the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. It says the Holy Spirit will lead and teach you all truths. And so again, if they're finding it, convoluted, confusing, and, and unknowable, then they're doing that scripture reading and seeking it merely from a human point of view, not being led by the Holy Spirit. And, and instead, we got to stop and invite the Holy Spirit that it says the Holy Spirit will teach you all these things. It will reveal it. So inviting the Holy Spirit, teach me, reveal to me, help me understand what's going on here. And then also invite some other spiritual mentors along that can help you to be able to understand and unpack so you can properly read the word of God. And then, and, and many of you have been there where you did read it and it was confusing and disorder and, and you couldn't make any sense of it. And then the Holy Spirit and God touched you and all of a sudden you were reading it with a new fresh set of eyes and all of a sudden what was so confusing and crazy is now so clear and so vivid to you now in a way that it never was before. That the word of God is alive and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. Because we know that John uh, eight forty four says that when Satan lies, he speaks his native language. He is a liar and the father of lies. And so the deceitful one, the, the enemy, will come and try to, he's the one of disorder. He's the one of chaos, not God. God is one of peace and unity and order. The enemy is one of lies, confusion, and disorder. 
So when we find ourselves in that, we know that we're being tripped up by the enemy. When we find ourselves in, in order and peace, we know we're with God. And even people said this of, in, in Luke 20, said this of Jesus. They said, teacher, they said, we know that you speak and teach what is right and you are not influenced by what others think. You teach the way of God truthfully. So we know that from that, Jesus followed in his father's footsteps, teaching what was right and true and not being swayed by the culture, not being swayed by the people, is that his truth was honoring of God regardless of the time, the culture, or the people that he was with, is that people recognized that about him. He was willing to preach and say the hard things to the wrong people. He wasn't just preaching to the choir. He was preaching to those that wanted to kill him. And sometimes by preaching the very things that God put on his heart to share, it made, him, made them want to kill him even more and even faster. In fact, if you recall, Jesus' first trip into the temple to preach from the word of God, it ends with them trying to shove him off of a cliff to kill him. I mean, can you imagine? I remember the first time I preached in the church. If that would have ended with people trying to throw me off a cliff, I'd be like, well, <laughs> all right. But, uh, how'd it go? Not good. Not good. It was not good. I will not be invited back, I'll tell you that much. Uh, nor will I go back uh, to this. I am done. So you get that, that part of it. Number three is this. From Matthew eleven nineteen. it says, But wisdom is shown right by its results. Wisdom is shown right by its results. So we know that as time goes on, again, we've, we've, even in our lifetime, we have seen such a radical shift in morality and ways of living that in the end, it's proved right by its results. I mean, look around us. Look at the, the rates of depression, anxiety, suicide, pill addictions, you name it. The list can go on and on. They are all at all-time highs in this country the further we've moved away from God and we've moved away from the morality of, of Christianity the crazier it has gotten the more dysfunctional and, and, and the more chaotic people's lives have gotten and they're desperate and they're hurting and wisdom is proved right by its results it's like just look around wisdom is proved right by its results so if that's true then what long-term good results come from this seemingly hard scripture? So when we're reading hard, challenging scripture, it's taking a step back to see what long-term good results will come from this. Or when God says that I need to deny myself in X, Y, and Z areas, it's because the results, if I don't, the results are going to go badly for me. The results are going to go badly for my family. The results are going to go poorly for my community that we've got to be able to realize that the God isn't just a party pooper. He's not just a, a spiritual buzzkill, like saying, don't do this and do this. So many people think that God's just being a buzzkill. No, it's because he knows and sees what that leads to in your life and in the lives of people around you. That that's why God hates sin so much, because he knows what it's doing to you. He knows what it's doing to the people around you. He knows where this is going to lead to in 10 years, in 20 years, in 100 years, in 1,000 years. That's why God, we see that repeat throughout all the Old Testament. And in Proverbs, in several different places, it says that there is a way that seems right to a person, but it ends in death. So there's a way that seems right. And that's the way that Jesus says to, to lay down, give up your own way. And he's saying, give it up because it's going to lead to your destruction anyway. He knows because wisdom is proved right by its results. He knows where that way is going to take you and it leads to death. So he's saying, get off that path, get on the righteous path of God because this path has eternal, everlasting life. It has abundant life. That has nothing but death and destruction and calamity and fear and addiction and bondage with it in the end. So you've got to get off of that way. And that's where we pray and we ask in Psalm 5, 8, Lord, lead me in the right path, O Lord, or my enemies will conquer me. Make your way plain for me to follow. And that's what the word of God does. All right, number four, what meta-narratives does this align with? 
So number four is this, the, the idea of a meta narrative. What a, a meta narrative is, is just an overarching kind of a account or, or interpretation of events. So it's a way of taking a step back. What's the, what are, what's the big theme that's happening here? So when we're trying to read and understand scripture, it's really, really helpful to step back and say, okay, well, what, is, what do I know that's true about the themes of the Bible? That I can take this scripture and I can try to read it and understand it from this theme that I know is over the whole word of God. And some examples of that are things like the creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. Creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. So even when we were reading through those lists of sins that would cause people to, to not inherit the kingdom of God, we know that that's not how God created us to live. That in creation, he created in perfect unity and love. But then there's sin entered the world. There was this fall, not just from Adam and Eve, but there's a fall in every single one of our lives. And that it's happening. But God's got us on this, this love story and this journey where we're the prodigal sons that he wants to bring back and to restore and to redeem. So we know that these things are all, we can see it happening throughout all of history from beginning to end that we've all experienced this fall that Jesus Christ came to restore and to redeem. And so we're, we're putting it into those contexts. That God's a good father that we talked about is another theme. And if I know God is good, then I need to take a step back and try to understand this scripture from it coming from a good father rather than an angry father, but from one who is slow to anger and abounding in everlasting love. Reading it as if it's a love letter. If I'm reading these hard scriptures, but I know that at the end of the day, this is a, this is a love letter to me written by the father with a lost son or a lost daughter in mind, then all of a sudden I'm reading it differently rather than somebody trying to just beat me over the head with this thing or somebody using this from a position of power and authority to get me to conform to their ways. If I'm, that, those are two wildly different ways of reading and engaging with the word of God. It being a love letter for, to a lost son or daughter rather than it being a club to beat somebody into submission uh, from a place of power. Wildly different, yet people have got it in their heads and they read it from one or the other. Other things, that it's a story of a wedding between a bridegroom and a bride. That we know that, that there's several utterances and, and, and illustrations of the bridegroom and the bride. That it's a wedding, it's a covenant. That's a theme in the Bible, that's a meta narrative. this covenant, this unbreakable covenant that God has made because he is faithful and true and he will always fulfill his promises. He has never broken a covenant. He will never do it. He can't go against himself. And so we know that there are these promises and that we are the bride of Christ, that he's willing to go to the greatest lengths and that he is bringing us into unity and covenant. Other things like personal value is a resounding narrative, meta-narrative of the word of God. It begins in Genesis saying that we were made in the image of God, male and female, that we have value on our life that comes from God and God alone. Even in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where we read that, the other scripture about the things that will keep you from the kingdom of God, and some of you were like that, but you've been restored and reconciled and cleansed and made holy. And then it goes on to say, that, you know, run from sexual sin. And it says, for your, your body is the, the temple of the, of the living God. So you have that you were bought at a high price, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 6. You were bought at a high price. You have value on your life. You have unspeakable value because you were bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So you have to read it with one of the meta narratives in mind that it is one of personal value. You have immense value. That is the story. So when you're reading some of these hard scriptures, it's that you have incredible value that you are a lost son with a destiny. And that's what I love. Dan Muller also said that, you know, when he was growing up, people never, never, pro you know, never preached that, never taught that. You know, he was always made it, you know, led to believe that, that Christ died because he was a sinner. And he just got this whole depiction that his identity was being in a sinner and being despicable. Rather than saying, like, we missed it. Like, yes, Christ died because I sinned. But he didn't die because I was a sinner. He died because I was a lost son with a destiny. He said, nobody ever told me that I was a house fit for a king. 
that I had that kind of value on my life, that I would be the temple of a living God, that when I profess that faith in Christ and I invite in the Holy Spirit, that wow, like I'm the temple of a living God? Are you kidding me? Like that's crazy, the value that's there. And then the very last thing, and I'll wrap up, because I know we're pushing it here, but is the, the fifth one, to put Scripture in context with other Scripture. Sometimes I hear people talk about, you know, uh, well, you need to, to really understand the Word of God. You need to go back 2,000 plus years ago, and you need to understand the, the Hebrew and the Greek and the, the Roman cultures, and you need to, and, which is great. If you have the time and the means and the ability to do that, like, fantastic. But that's not something that you, we can naturally expect and, and require of, of the average person before they can make any bit of sense of this. So, you know, if you can do that, awesome. But if you can't, at least read the whole in, entirety of the word so that you can put scripture in context with other scripture. And that's the example that we get from Jesus. In, in Matthew uh, chapter 4 is when he's tempted. He's taken out into the wilderness for 40 days and for 40 nights, and he's tested over the very word of God. And we see what happens, that when Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, after being baptized and receiving the Holy Spirit, he uses scripture to break down and reject the devil's temptation. For every scriptural temptation from the devil, Jesus responds with, no, it is written, or no, the scriptures say. Because what the devil was doing is that in that temptation, he would take a line from scripture and he would try to tempt Jesus with it. To, if, you know, to turn the stone into bread. Jesus says, no, it is written that the, the man does not live off of bread alone, but lives off of the very word of God. And then the, the Satan then uses scripture to tempt him to jump off of the temple, to jump off of the highest point, and that the angels would come. And he says, no, no, no it is also written. So when Jesus was tempted, the, the enemy was using scripture. He was cherry-picking scripture out of the word of God to tempt Jesus. And what Jesus did is that he put it in context with other scripture and would say, no, 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 it, but it's also saying this. So that's part of it, is that we have to understand that, yes, we can be against certain skin, sin, but it also says we need to love people, that we need to love our neighbors as ourselves, that we need to be moving in love and forgiveness and grace and mercy and power. So you can't just take, you've got to be able to put scripture with other scripture and that's how you build a well-rounded walk with God is by knowing it in its entirety and knowing it for, and reading it firsthand to know what all is in here. So you can say, yes, it says that, but it also says this. Yes, it says that, but it also says this. That's the way to understand and read and interpret scripture and also disciple others in this process. And that's part of your discipleship call is that when you're talking with people about their faith, about the word of God, they're going to have certain scriptures on lock in, that have been ingrained and burned into their memory. And it's usually oftentimes unfavorable ones or ones that have been used, uh, uh, that they're using as a way to reject God or to not be embracing the very word of God. And you got to be able to say, you know, I get that it says that, but it also says this. Give them a bigger identity, a bigger purpose, and a bigger interpretation to work from because in Matthew twenty-two twenty-nine, 29 Jesus says and, and speaks this over to the people that were asking questions of him asking they were always asking questions and he says your mistake is that you don't know the scripture and you don't know the power of God so that is key you have to know we do not want to fall for the same mistake that others made the same mistake where we don't know the scriptures and we don't know the power of God because that's the calling on our life is to commit. Once you've a committed Christian, you're committing to knowing the word of God and knowing the power of God. And that's what we're doing. Is, and that's the beauty of today. I know we went a little bit long because of those testimonies. But it was, we're knowing the scripture, but we also, it's so important to hear the stories of the power of God. That's what we started with. Starting with hearing about the power of God. We need to know the power of God. And we need to know the scripture of God. And that deadly combination, it is a powerful combination of power and truth. Amen? Amen? So dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray over each one of us. I pray that you would give us a hunger and a thirst for more and more of your word. Be your Holy Spirit. Lord, we say, Lord, your Holy Spirit is welcome here in our hearts and in our minds. Holy Spirit, teach us. 
Take us to new depths of understanding. Give us fresh revelation of your word. Lord, when we open this, your word, and we read through your scripture, Lord, unlock the mysteries. For we're living on a side that the prophets of the Old Testament, they would have given anything to live in the revelation we have now. They were prophesying about things that wouldn't take place for another 500 years, a thousand years, or beyond. <laughs> and yet we're living in a place and a time where we've seen those prophecies come true. We know the revelation and how it's worked itself out. So Lord, reveal it. Take us deeper. Allow it to penetrate our hearts. Allow it to renew our minds. And allow it to change our lives. So that, Lord, when we pick this up, that we would read it not to get through it, but we would read it to become it. Help us today to become one more degree of glory closer to being like Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that all God's mighty men said, amen. amen.